I've got the new mic, but I've got this great T-shirt on from Chicago. I did a seminar in Chicago about uh, maybe 20 years ago. And anyway, it was uh, Leslaw Sametovsky's dojo, a fantastic time. We went to Wisconsin Dells for a camp. Of course, Rochelle, Daniel, good to see you. Paul, Vin, nice to see you, man. Marco, Torbjörn, us. Hope you're well. Frederick, thanks for the chat earlier, probably last night in your terms, but earlier today in mine. Herman, us, loud and clear. Thank you very much. Arvid, us, good to see you. So I'm going to um, run through the book. I had some. I had an interesting thought. Let me just. I'm going to look at the book not on the computer, but on my uh, laptop, uh, on my iPad. Uh, this is one of the color pages at the front. So we've increased the color pages from from uh, 16 to 32. And for those who have ever been involved in book printing, you'll understand that um, when you have a book, it's like you get a big piece of paper. They print it on a big piece of paper. If you could imagine, I'm looking for a big piece of paper. Here we go. So you get a piece of paper and they actually print it on like monstrous pieces of paper and those pieces of paper are folded and folded like this, see? Now, if you could imagine that piece of paper was so big that the finished product is A4 or whatever, so in that you now have 16 pages and then they trim it. So when they print 16 pages, they actually print one big piece of paper and trim it up and it turns into 16 pages. So everything is done in units of 16. So we've decided, Willie came up with a great idea. We had so many wonderful colour photos that we've decided to uh, run a 32-page colour section, which is pretty exciting. And I was just looking at some of these great photos that go back over the years and this one here, I'm going to zoom in on that. This was a great photo. I was 21. That's me standing out the back. And this is Nobuyuki Kishishihan. This was in New York at the Catskill Mountains. And in the front row, you can see the brown belt. That's Sensei Annie Gottlieb. And her partner was Jacques Sandulescu, who I've written a whole chapter about in the book. And this was the 1980 camp we went to a camp up in the Catskill Mountains and I just thought about it because there was a guy who couldn't make it he's a Japanese guy he was one of Kishi Nobuyuki's students really nice guy he was Uchi Deshi and I stayed with uh, Kishi Shihan as an Uchi Deshi for a couple of weeks uh, and trained with him I was going to train in New York for a lot longer like I'd planned almost a year to go and train in New York I hadn't made permanent arrangements because on my way through Los Angeles, I, I dropped in at the Self-Realization Fellowship Headquarters, which was the Yogananda uh, Yoga Organization, which I've mentioned numerous times in the book. But anyway, um, and I ended up visiting some classes and so on, and I was so impressed and so taken by uh, the quality of the people that I went to New York and stayed for two weeks and then zipped back and stayed in, in uh, LA for the rest of the year and uh, started, you know, doing yoga and self-realization fellowship rather than uh, the SR, uh, the uh, Kyogushin over in New York. But this is a great experience. But Nobuyuki Kiyoshihan had a Japanese Uchi Deshi and he was a tough son of a gun, but he was also a third Dan in judo. And I just remembered when I looked at this picture because that was really the roots of my, um, yes, of course, I, um, Tigre, I, my first interpreting job. In fact, I nearly put a couple of pictures in the book of my first interpreting job, which was at the Aichigero Ayama Yasuhiko Miura Miyuki came out. I knew all their names from when I was a youngster from reading the books, uh, but they also brought out some Students, one's name was Eddie Frazier, which we got on really well because my middle name was Frazier. Um, so we thought maybe we were related somewhere along the line, which was a bit hard to 
fathom because he was African American, <laughs> but we had the same name. My mum's maiden name is Frazier. Uh, there was a guy named Joe Claranino. No, not Joe Claranino. He's from um, um, uh, England. Lovely Joe, Shihan Joe. No, there was a guy, a Joe, with another Italian name. Uh, he brought out a team of fighters and, and they competed in the eight ball Japan. So that was the first time that I met uh, um, Oyama Shigeru Oyama Yasuhiko. And um, I was sitting at the, a big table with all these great names. Uh, oh, it's Leon. Good to see you. Thanks for joining in. Hope Brooklyn's under control. Uh, and I was sitting next to this really nice Japanese guy, and I was really, there's two funny experiences happened. One was this really nice Japanese guy next to me was chatty, and, and I'm talking to him, and his English was Joe Menino. There you go, Mike. Yeah, it was Joe Menino. And, and there was another guy named um, Clay, African-American guy, really nice guy, big beard, the works. Um, I have the program here from the 8th Ball Japan. How about that? I'm sitting in this really nice Japanese guy who was next to me, so helpful and so kind and all that. And then um, I introduced myself and I asked him what his name was. And his name was Miura Miyuki. <laughs> and it was like one of the great, you know, the great Miura Miyuki. Uh, so... Um, I was a little bit um, awestruck at that point. This is amazing, this, this um, because 1976, so it's got, you know, it's like when Ninomiya Joko and Azuma Takashi and all these guys were still, you know, Nobuyuki Kishi, were, uh, they're all still fighters, you know. And uh, I'm just looking for the actual program with the fighters in it. Here we go. Clyde, Clyde Koi, Joe Menino and uh, Eddie Frazier, they all came out and fought in the old Japan. But this reminded me of something because when I was my last training session with Nobuyuki Kishi, I was heading back to L.A. the next day. He kind of sicked that Japanese guy onto me. He was like the, one of the East Coast champion fighters. And uh, he just, I guess, Nobuyuki Kishi just wanted to see if I'd really learn anything over the last few weeks with him. Um, so he, he put this Japanese fighter onto me and... Uh, you know, he was a, a it was a tough match. We were going hard. We were literally trying to smash each other. But he had this wonderful advantage. He was a third Dan in judo. And every time I'd start to work him, uh, and I was fairly young. I was young. I was 21. I'd just come second in the Australian Championship. So I was feeling fairly confident. And I... I was holding my own. In fact, I was starting to get on top of him. But every, the funny thing was every time I'd get close, he'd go bang and he'd try and I'd land on my back and I'd go, wow, this is just crazy. You know, and we'd start fighting again and as soon as I'd come in, bang, he'd throw me again, bang. And he really, his judo was beautiful. And that was the, the seed, would you believe? That was the seed that made me think, you know, I really need to do something about this uh, – not knowing how to throw and grab and hold and take down and control. And I went back to L.A., and here's the crazy thing. I used to train in L.A. mainly by myself because I was focused on the yoga, but I get up every morning before dawn and I do an early run up to um, the uh, past the uh, Hollywood Bowl up to um, the observatory, the Griffith Park Observatory. Uh, in LA, I lived down in um, in Hollywood, and um, and then in the afternoon I'd go to the uh, LA City College around the corner, and there was an athletic track and some athletic rooms, training rooms, and I just train, I do my own thing, do some kata push ups, sit ups, quads, do sprints around the oval, and there were a few guys there, maybe half a dozen guys who were all like really smiling martial artists so I go and train with them a bit learn a few things they're really quick and snappy and all that and then I could see in one of the rooms in the distance there were these guys doing martial arts so I went and had a peek and they were doing like judo and grappling and I thought nah you know I still didn't fully get it I, I thought no you know I'll, I'll stick to my stand-up I didn't really understand what they were doing but would you believe that happened to turn out, it, it turns out that was uh, Jean LaBelle and the Jean LaBelle school uh, of, of grappling. And if 
if I had gone in and joined and started to train with him for the year that I was there, I can't imagine where I'd be today. It's one thing to say that my grappling would be much better than what it is, or at least I would have been way ahead of the curve in that respect. But at the same time, maybe it would have affected my involvement with Kyokushin because at that time I went back and started my tournament career. I started fighting in 78 in tournaments. So this was only 1980. So it was still new and I fought through for the 1987 Worlds. So if I'd got involved in grappling, maybe it would have affected all that. But I just thought how interesting because I just happened to talk to uh, Uncle Gene, Gene LaBelle, um, about three, two or three hours ago. I speak to him once a week. Uh, and um, I thought of that when I saw this photo in the book. So that's um, an interesting little side story there. And, of course, Nobuyuki Shihan, that's him there. He was a wonderful man. Um, and a great Kyokushin fighter who I just think never quite got a handle on uh, living in New York. Mike Gordon, you might be able to spread more light on it for me. But I just think, you know, he, because he never mastered the language, he never fully developed the confidence that he should have had. But these are great photos here. There's Wally and Wally Snellbelt and Gary O'Neill on their first Uchi Deshi up in the top. And then next to it is the photo of them at the... Uh, I think the 2696 uh, All Japan where Gary came second and Wally came sixth. So they had all these wonderful trophies in front of them there. Um, Jillian Farmer down the bottom, I've mentioned her. She was my first female black belt who right now, even as we talk, is the head of the medical division of the United Nations in New York. So she went a long way with her... Uh, her medical career. She was training six days a week without fail and it was hard training while she was studying medicine through university, never missed a session. Um, and the great forward by Dolph Lundgren, that's exciting as well. We've, we've rehashed, redesigned a lot of the, uh, the book and it just looks fantastic. Uh, the full, when I first produced the book in 87, I sold it for 39.95 Australian, so basically $40 Australian. Um, and it was slightly high on the, on the price at that time, and I had to deal with mailing them out through the mail and so on. Um, there was no internet, so people had cut little vouchers out of magazines and mail them to me, and I'd mail the book back. Um, and the book was... At that time, it seemed quite expensive to produce. So the, the, the margin that I made to cover the costs as well as make a little bit of a profit was, you know, not as big as you know, anyone who's written a book will tell you. It's never as much as you think it should be. But anyway, I finally found this printer and we set the price of the book. And I know that I know it's on the high side, but we did some research and actually the book priced it's, you know, I know it's expensive, but um, I have full faith in it. Um, we, we priced it at sixty nine ninety five US. And would you believe we did a, uh, a, a, an inflation analysis and sixty nine ninety five US is almost exactly the same as thirty nine ninety five Australian in 1987. So there you go. We've, what we thought was a fair price in 87 and what we thought is a fair price in 2020. In, if you take an, uh, inflation into account, it works out it's exactly the same price. So we're, we're really happy about that. So that the, the um, pre-production uh, orders, you can buy them online, will be going up very soon. I'm just waiting to hear back from the guys who are helping me with the, um, with the website. Uh, I'm going to have a little bit of a read here today. Um, I think I read the white, the orange belt, the yellow belt sections, um, but I thought I might just read the green belt and the brown. Have I read the green, green belt and brown belt section? Oh, here's another great photo too that we're able to put in. The site will be that, Mike but it's not up yet. So if you go there, chances are you'll just get bounced. I'll check while I'm, even, while I'm talking to you. But they're working on it, so it's kind of shut down at the moment. Um, and, 
yeah, it can't be reached. So they're working on it at the moment, um, but it won't be long. I'd say I'd anticipate uh, within a week it'll be all, all there. Uh, and, of course, we have to work out postage costs uh, and so on. So it's pretty exciting. Oh, it's Paddy. Didn't see you there. Um, Paddy's, Paddy's doing his Kyogushin Shuffle. Uh, everybody should have tuned into some of his um, interviews. But you've released that little ebook, haven't you, Paddy? Uh, if you want to put the link here, I'm not too sure of the link, but if you put the link so everybody can go and get a copy of that ebook as well. I, I, I haven't looked at it myself, but um, put the put the link down there, Patty. That'll be great. And the good news is, out of Victoria, that the uh, shutdown is easing, so it won't be long. But anyway, I got this great photo. This was taken by Graham Munro. Graham Munro was the is the guy that took the um, the cover photo as well. I love this photo. See that? Now that's in front of the Opera House. And the guy on the left is Kanayama. He was one of Japan's uh, top fighters, tournament fighters. And next to him is uh, Shihan Brian Fitkin. So that's over here. That's Brian Fitkin there. And that's um, Brian Fitkin. I've got to tell you, if you don't know anything about Brian Fitkin, he was one of Kyogushin's great, great fighters in his day. He actually fought in the first All Japan Championship. He won his first two fights with ease. He realised that it was creating a bit of a stir that the Japanese weren't going to let a foreigner win the first tournament. So um, he basically eased off a little bit and lost the third fight on uh, points. Um, and... He went back to Europe. He was one of Europe's top fighters. And this is a little bit of information that not a lot of people realise, that the first team to beat, the, I may have mentioned it before, the first team to beat uh, Japan in the World Wuko Championship, so the non-contact style uh, type fighting, the first team to beat them was the British team. And of the four fighters, the three were Kyokushin fighters. So... That really threw a cat amongst the pigeons in Japan when they lost the world championships. Would you believe this? They lost the world team, uh, team championships in WUKO, non-contact fighting, to uh, the British team, which had three Kyokushin fighters in it. And I have a feeling Brian Fitkin, um, it may have been Howard Collins, and a guy named Tiki Donovan who left... Kyokushin, he was Kyokushin then, but he left Kyokushin and, and started up Ishin Liu. And would you believe the coach of that team was Shihan Steve Arneel? So it was a, a dominating time for Kyokushin. Shihan Fitkin Graham in the 10th QR, that is so cool. So you'd know more about him than I do, Torbjörn. But I, he's one of my heroes. He's always been one of my heroes. And, you know, he, he would fight. He could switch between non-contact and full contact just like that, just like someone can switch between shifting gears and automatic in a car. It was so easy for him. He was such an incredible natural. So that's him, number two there. Next to him, of course, is uh, Dolph Lundgren in the middle. And then next to him, this one here, that's Sensei Brian Ellison. And he was one of my instructors when I was a high school kid. And Brian was a bit like Brian Fitkin in Australia. He was an early Kyokushin tournament champion. Um, he he was crazy good with nunchaku and knives and so on. Uh, in fact, he had a scene in um, in uh, Beyond Thunderdome where he he did some stuff with his weapons in that. Um, but he was this this photo was taken at the time of the shoot of the movie called The Punisher, which had Lou Gossett Jr. in it, and of course Dolph was one of the stars in that. And then over here on the far and is uh, Kenji Amaki, of course, the uh, sixth world tournament champion who uh, was in this movie too. He played one of the bad guys in this movie. Okay. That's a great photo, isn't it? And that's, again, by um, Graham Munro, who did the cover. Yeah, it is a piece of history, that photo. The, look, this book, I'm so grateful to Willie. He's what Willie Schultz, remember Willie from uh, last when last week when I was in uh, Cairns, we did a, 
an interview together. Um, it's a, uh, what Willie's done with the book is just wonderful and it just gets better and better and better. We've tightened it. We've, um, uh, you know, uh, what we've been able to do with the book is just fantastic. Here's some more great photos. Oops, went back. Here's some more great photos. So the ones on this side are all taken by, remember Josh who did the, um, the uh, training with me on Monday as my partner on Monday at the training, his dad is a photographer and his dad took all those photos and there's some great, just some great photos. And on the other side here, this one here, that's that fellow in the middle, Mark Sang, he's, he's been a good buddy of mine. He was my first black belt. And next to him is Eddie Rowe. I always talk about one arm Eddie. One arm Eddie was the most courageous fellas I knew. He lost his arm in a car accident, lost it here, by the way. And uh, he went on and fought Kokushin tournaments and everything. Um, what happened? And um, and he used to train. He was he and Mike Witten. They graded in '89 together. They were my second black belt students. And Mark Sang graded the black belt in '88. He was my first black belt. And here's a little. And this is Gary, of course. This is Gary in the world tournament, the sixth world tournament. But here's a little bit of interesting thing. See that little girl there? That's Gary's sister, Christine. And she used to train too. And, you know, now she'd be, I guess, 40 plus because this photo was taken in about 19, um, well, I don't even, see, Eddie hasn't got his black belt and he did his black belt in 89. Mark, it looks like he might have his black belt or brown belt. So this photo is around 1988. So there you go. Another little bit of history. Just some wonderful histories. Willie's, Willie is fantastic, um, what he's done with this book, the way he's placed pictures and this is one of my favourites, that's Gary fighting, but you see what I did is I put quintessential combat centre in the background, I took the uh, Japanese there was a Japanese ad there, so rather than sketch that into the sketch, I, I put my own dojo's name in there just for fun. Uh, read this section if I could. Uh, this is actually the section on the black belt so if you've got any comments or any questions, by all means, um, put them in there. I'm just going to sip a cup of tea and uh, read this section on, uh, from the black belt section of the book. Oh, let me just check that page number, 169. So I'll come back to that. I just want to show you something else. Something else I've added in the back. Originally, I did a lot of footnotes, and it still has a lot of footnotes, but... I had a lot of people asking that they want to know the kanji or the, the, the Japanese words for, um, for different uh, terminology and so on. So what I've done in the back here, I've, I've got a whole, let me does it go that way, wrong way. I've got a whole section here. This is all the key names and uh, a whole section on the Japanese and Chinese and Korean even. Um, characters for those key words. So anyone who is academically bent, that's all for you too. Um, I love the way Willie has done. So I see this. That's my signature and my chop, my seal that I put at the, uh, you know, when I do a calligraphy and um, I can show you one up the front. Cause, and what Willie's done is he's turned that into a wonderful feature. So you see this. That's the uh, title page, and you see how down the bottom he's put that little um, chop, and just it just adds such a beautiful touch to it too. So um, he's done a wonderful job. Good on you, Willie. Uh, looking at it at the moment, so I'm just going to read this section, getting the most out of tra at training. And I'm actually enjoying just tra chatting anyway, but we'll we'll just read on. In the world today, can be found countless distractions which make embracing the responsibilities of life less necessary. Karateka, generally speaking, are highly realistic and practical people. Those unable to face the reality of life and of themselves are not capable of maintaining serious dedication to karate. Conversely, even a little effort to make daily training a habit will bring untold rewards in every aspect of existence. So there's a sample page, and if I zoom in on that, let me zoom in on it for you, Mike. Uh, 
See there? So it's, it's the Japanese, the Chinese, and the Korean. So it's got all of them. Um, I don't even know if there is any, I think, uh, Uchi Naguchi, which I'm thinking of, the Okinawan language, the word for the Okinawan. Uh, there you go. So there's a little bit of katakana there. But the rest is all kanji, uh, hiragana. There's some hiragana up there. Uh, Korean down here. Um, so it's, it's oh, <laughs> yes, that's my name in, that's my name in, uh, let me, I'll go to the, uh, my favorite little app. You know, my favorite app, that um, one that I always like, Zen Brush. They've recently upgraded to a, uh, to a Zen Brush 3. So I'll just, let me just, I don't even know how to clear it now. I'm still, I literally downloaded Zen Brush 3, um, even as I was setting up. So, yeah. So um, it is all katakana, Mike. What I'll do is I'll write it there for you. Bit shaky because I'm holding this thing in my hand. Well, that's that's the katakana, right? But then if I do it the way I did it in the So I kind of did it a little bit stylishly like that and I extended that stroke. So that's why it looks a bit different when um when you look at it in the book. So you see that's the same thing except I've just extended that downstroke. Now I, I yeah, so it's all katakana. And the chop is one of those stone Chinese stone chops that says cam, C A M. That's I just made that myself. Many years ago, getting the most out of training. In karate as in life, one must be prepared to accept the discipline of hard work with enthusiasm, no matter how difficult it may at first seem. The dojo is built upon a foundation of self-discipline. People who have no self-control, no respect for authority and no respect for others simply cannot accept the demands of discipline, nor reap its rewards in the dojo to enjoy a successful life, one must exercise discipline and accept the authorities of society one chooses to be part of. Intriguing that you have also decided to include Hangu. Well, I've got a little bit of Chinese terminology because there's a lot of words like um, Tuan Fa and, you know, Shaolin and a lot of the, and even um, Kaisei, where I talked about Kaisei no Gendi and um, the earliest origins I can find of the word kaisei because it's not really a Japanese word. It's an imported word from China. And so I've just given um, the pronunciation of that. And the reason I chose the hangul is because in the early section of Solsai's history was all the names of the towns and everything, like the, the noun, name of the town that he lived in, uh, Waryong-di. But the beautiful thing of Waryong-di is that it also translates as Garyu D, or the village of Garyu. So that's why he chose the name Garyu for his favorite kata, uh, because that was actually the name of the village that he was born in in Korea. So what I've done is I've just given um, his name, Korean name, Sone Chu's Korean name, and some geographical names, his family name, and so on. I've just included the Hangul for that. That's all figure. The two or so hours you spend at training each night can be used or abused. You can pretend or extend. Without a degree of discipline, the body tends towards laziness by uncompromisingly creating a habit of self-effort. Much more can be achieved in the same amount of time spent at the dojo. And I find that that becomes more and more so over time because um, different schools, different um, styles and different martial arts do have this um, approach of uh, training being, you know, less demanding. They, they say, well, 
you know, um, you can do your hard training. And they, they, what they say is is true. If you can, if you can um, maintain the discipline to do it, but usually it becomes all talk and no action. Um, they say that the dojo, you just focus on technique learning and so on and you do all the fitness out of it. But from what I've seen, um, the best fitness training is the hard training that you can do in the dojo because you're surrounded by um, people who inspire you, who lift you, and you're not going to get lazy. But when you say, well, I'll just go to the dojo to learn technique and I'll do my fitness training at home, never happens. Firstly, one must not be satisfied with the status quo. Such an attitude will produce progress only at a very ordinary rate. The human potential is truly revolutionary and not merely evolutionary. That is where the difference between human beings and animals lies. I'm picking up typos. The fact that we alone have the potential to determine the rate of our evolution. Man, by exercising wisely his free will, creates his own destiny. He is not a puppet with fate as the puppeteer pulling the strings at random. That's pretty important because um, that's why you go to the dojo. You go to the dojo because you're making a conscious decision to improve your life. You're not just going to live according to a uh, predestined uh, instinctive flow. By living in accord with natural law and guided by wise discrimination, we are assured of a normal, healthy evolution. By observing our attitude, bringing our emotional reactions to events under control and adding certain spiritual practices such as affirmations, prayer and techniques of pranayama and meditation, we're able to change the speed and trajectory of that evolution. In the same way, listening to our intuition following the laws of biomechanics, training in accord with karate's technical instructions passed down from the masters who went before us, and paying attention to the dojo's guidelines of etiquette and cooperation, progress will naturally come much faster. The determining factor is attitude. Attitude determines rate of progress. If you think, about, if you think like a sloth, you'll progress like one. If you think like an eagle, you'll soar to ever higher altitudes of attainment and mastery. Do not satisfy yourself with merely achieving yesterday's levels. If your goal is 100 push-ups, don't get there and fall asleep under the tree of self-satisfaction. Set a new target when that one is reached. Forget yesterday. The goals of the past belong to the past. Today should bring new hope and new vision. The only limits are those you create for yourself. Then there's a quote here from the Haga Kude, the famous book. There is one transcending level, and this is the most excellent of all. This person is aware of the endlessness of entering deeply into a certain way and never thinks of himself as having finished. This is what I always find interesting about um, karate and the dojo, that people actually come along and train for five years or a limited time or... You know, it, it, like it says, means through all our lives, through all our lives. That's the key words. All our lives through the through the discipline of um, karate. So you know, really, you get on the karate path and you stick to it. Something like a, a disciplined path that you can adhere to every day that helps to improve your character in one respect, speeds up your spiritual evolution. And that is given to you as a gift. And if you turn your nose up at that gift, well, then it's not given to you again very easily or very quickly. I'm talking about life after life. So it's like you give someone a gift and they look at the gift and you go, oh, just chuck it away. Well, obviously, immediately you're, you're going to be a little bit reluctant to want to give them a gift again. Well, it's the same with this. Karma works like that. Karate is such an incredible gift. It, we have no idea how powerful the gift of karate is, not just because it keeps our bodies fit, but because it keeps, keeps our minds fit. And uh, if you were to do a, a demographic comparison of people who train hard in a dojo 
compared to people who don't, but all the other parameters being the same, you'd be amazed at how, in general, the level of emotional help, uh, uh, the level of emotional health and the level of um, calmness and the ability to process life's experiences without letting the emotional charges get too carried away. I think you'll find people who do karate regularly um, really do well, generally speaking. It's always a bell curve, of course. But, um, and even, and I've written a whole chapter of this in my next book, The Buddha Blueprint, talking about uh, karate as a, uh, as a therapy. Uh, I just think it's wonderful. Now, you don't get those gifts very easily. If, if you know, you go around to your nephew's um, place for Christmas and you buy a nice little model aeroplane, and he looks at it and throws away and says, oh, I want an iPad. Well, the next time you go, you're not going to give him an iPad or a model airplane. You know, gratitude is everything. Well, it's the same. Karate is such a beautiful gift, and we should not abuse that opportunity. We should um, be humble and treat it uh, as it deserves to be treated. There you go. That's my little say. <laughs> Invigorate your willpower to accept the demand. Oh, yeah, Patty, by the way, can you put, did you put the link um, to your um, new ebook? Don't forget to put down uh, a link here to your ebook. I'm not too sure if you did. Um, make sure you do so people can go there and have a look. Invigorate your willpower to accept the demands of training without hesitation, and you will never have to look back except that certain pleasures must be forsaken on the path of the martial arts if your goal is self-improvement, of self-improvement is an honest one. Where there is darkness, there is no light. Destroy the darkness of laziness and a life devoid of purpose with the light of focused, regular training. Some things in life are simply incompatible. Training is the chariot that will carry you to your destination. Dedication, de determination, commitment, and volition are the trusty steeds that pull your chariot ever on. All along the path of Buddha, seemingly impassable mountains rise up before you, yet through wholehearted devotion, the nature of our attitude towards those trials changes and the once feared obstacles becomes, become welcome challenges. You, you notice that in your own life. Huh? You know, when... when you train in, particularly in Kyokushin, I mean, the other styles are, are great too, but I know in Kyokushin it demands a very solid level of, of fitness and, and courage in Kumite. And if you stick to that and you learn just to bow your head and say, Us, and if you're told to do something, just do it without question, then when you get out in the big wide world, all of a sudden you realise how disciplined you've become and how you do have that ability to um, accept challenges with so much ease and what you consider to be very normal and very challenging but very acceptable. Other people just like throw their hands up in the air and, and go into a state of shock, you know. So I think sometimes we don't even know the wonderful benefits that karate is giving us on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, I think that's really true. Never tire of learning. Hold the spirit in your heart eternally. Strive for knowledge of your art just as a drowning man fights for air. That's a Yogananda um, metaphor. Well, that's, I think it's a wonderful metaphor, you know, you have, to, you have to strive for knowledge just as a drowning man fights for air. Narrow-mindedness is self-defeating. Knowledge is power. And, and by narrow-mindedness and self-defeating, knowledge is power. We really have to keep checking ourselves with that because when you get involved deeply in a martial art, you fall in love with that martial art and you become very loyally attached to it. You love that martial art. So the danger of that is you put blinkers on and you, you ill consider or don't consider at all um, other martial arts. But that's why I was talking about that experience I had in 1980 with that judo player who just threw me from one end of the dojo to the other before I uh, spanked him.
<laughs> but anyway, um, that was an eye opener. I was doing great at range one and two. And even to the point where I was like the range three, if it ever got there. But as soon as it got to range four, bang, I was gone. I had no control over what he was into me in range four, the stand up grapple, because he was a third down in judo and a good judo player. Okay. So that's what I mean by you, 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 you shouldn't learn of, you shouldn't tire of learning. Gene LaBelle, um, he always says that to this section on John Blooming, where John Blooming, had never met Jean LaBelle. Jean LaBelle had never met John Blooming. I said to John Blooming, have you heard of Jean LaBelle? He says, no, nope, you know, which in his mind, what he was really saying was, well, if I haven't heard of him, couldn't be that good. And I said to Jean LaBelle, have you ever heard of John Blooming? He says, no. Nope. So anyway, um, I said to them, well, if you ever get a chance, get together. And then I had a phone call from John Blooming to say that he's in LA and he's about to go and meet um, John Blooming. And then about five hours later, I get a, another message. And I wrote, John Blooming spoke at length about training with Gene. He's the real thing. He taught me so many things I had not seen before. And you know that doesn't happen very often. And, I mean, John Blooming was very knowledgeable, particularly about grappling. He showed me different ways to do ankle locks and wrist locks and how to use the pressure points. He ended up the message by saying, boy, that Gene LaBelle really knows his stuff. I'm glad I met him. Thank you. So um, Gene LaBelle, so I, when Gene LaBelle told me about it, he, he said, yeah, he even said the same thing, man, that Gene, that John Blooming knows his stuff. But what he did was Gene LaBelle's coaches were a couple of guys named Carl Gotch and Lou Fez. They were his, grapp they were his grappling coaches. Um, and so he learned pure judo as well as, uh, catch wrestling, you know, the, the, they used to call them hookers um, because they literally do the hooks here or hook here or hook under the armpit, that sort of thing. And, you know, they'd hook, they'd use the body as a handle. And so they were called hookers. And um, even Jean LaBelle said later on, I, I said, Blooming is well known for awarding. Uh, anyway, I commented on Jean LaBelle received a 10th Dan Kyokushin Budokai certificate from John Blooming, and he doesn't normally give 10th Dan's out. I think he's only given it to like two or three people, and that's like Kurosaki, Kenji, and uh, Jean LaBelle. And I commented on it. I said, oh, you met John Blooming. How was it? Jean looked at the certificate and said, oh, yeah, very nice guy. He's good. He's knowledgeable, and I really respect what he did. I showed him some things he had not seen before. My own coaches, Carl Gotch and Lou Fez, you know, it was a whole different world. Man, that guy really knows his stuff. So Gene's very humble. I think Gene's pretty humble too because he re refers to Carl Gotch as one of, his, one of his teachers, but I also heard on the grapevine that, um, that either in a proper match or in training, Gene actually got the best of Carl Gotch once as well, um, but he would never say that out of respect. There's, that's just a few little snippets from the book, guys. Very excited. By this time next week, I hope that I'm able to say to you the website is up, the prices, uh, the pre-sales are ready, and the printer is printing. I love taking Kyokushin and moving into the grappling realms. If you're not grappling, you're missing out on something because you need to be able to transition into that realm if someone gets close to you. And if you can't do anything, if nothing else, maintain your balance, you're in trouble. But here's the beauty of it. You, of course, you can train and roll as you get older. A lot of injury, I believe, is connected to body weight. There's a, an inverse connection between body weight uh, and non-injury. The lighter you are, the less injured you seem to get. The heavier you are, the more injured you seem to get. So heavy equals more injury. But anyway, especially in grappling too, because if you can imagine you're grappling and you roll, well, if you're 120 Ks and you roll, that 120 K is going to hit the ground a lot harder than if you're 60 Ks. What I was getting at was the beauty of karate is that you can keep doing your kata, you know, go down the beach, suck in the fresh air and do your kata um, for as long as you can stand up. And if you can't stand up, do it in a chair, you know. Indeed, um, it was... 30th anniversary of my dad's passing a couple of weeks ago uh, and 
Yes, gets us all in the end. So this is why the objective of life is to prepare yourself for that moment. But thanks, guys. Appreciate you coming along. I hope you enjoyed hearing about the book. Uh, it's a very exciting time. And like I said, by this time next week, hopefully I've got a, an updated um, website. Us. Us, guys. Take care. Have a good weekend. Train well. See ya. <laughs>